this is a very complicated uh, subject, and it's, it's become very emotional. I, I hesitate to say that it's one of the most emotional topics maybe since the 1956 war with Eisenhower. Um, it's just brought out that, I remember the AWACS debate of 1981, the loan guarantees debate of 1991, those were heated moments. I don't think, uh, having been a journalist in those years, I don't, and certainly in the 91, I don't remember anything like this. And I worry that we've got another 30 days. So if I had, if you only remember one thing I say, and I said this to the White House correspondent of the New York Times, it's very important that this debate does not go off a cliff. And I worry that that is happening. And, um, I can get into more details later, but I just urge a certain civility, whatever your views are. I'm here to basically figure that these are very smart people, maybe not always the, the same level of knowledge. Um, and to the extent I could put forward the best arguments and the implications of both, and I figure you'll, you'll give your own thumbs up or thumbs down. My job is not to tell you what to think, just what to think about. And the way I want to do that is through an imaginary dialogue of President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu in the Oval Office, while they each make their case. And then I will discuss what I think some of the Rashi, I guess, would say how to interpret uh, that uh, those best arguments. And then, um, then open it up for questions with Larry, that conversation, and, and from you. Um, so, but before we do this, it's very important, and on your way out, we're, I'm going to give you a, a little, like, two-page handout, so you can, when your spouse or your children or grandchildren said, what did he talk about? You'll, you'll, you'll have it right there. Uh, so I'd rather not hand it out now with everyone fiddling through it. Um, the, but I need to just explain a few terms, and I don't want to get jargony on you. I'm not a nuclear physicist. Uh, I've had though, the honor in the last three years at the Washington Institute when I was not in government, uh, which I got to work in the office of the Secretary of State to deal with the Israeli-Palestine negotiations. I convened a dialogue, a U.S.-Israel dialogue on the Iranian nuclear challenge. And for me, it was a delight uh, who was worried about U.S.-Israel relationship to find the 20 smartest people I could, uh, 10 on each side, brilliant people who have been working in government many times on this issue. And I can say their names because it's become public. Um, David Petraeus, who was the last head of the CIA. Jim Cartwright, who was the deputy chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the U.S. Uh, military. Um, a guy named Gary Seymour, who, who headed nuclear nonproliferation in the first Obama term at the White House. Uh, a guy named Bob Einhorn, who was the deputy chief negotiator with Iran. Uh, a guy by the name of Steve Hadley, who was the national security advisor of George W. Bush. Uh, a guy named my colleague, who wrote books, a book together, and we appear frequently together, Dennis Ross, who also worked as the chief advisor, uh, Middle East advisor for President Obama. And there are others um, on, on both sides, on the Israeli side, Guys like Amos Yadlin, who was the head of Israeli military intelligence, uh, now runs Israel's most successful think tank. Um, was in the IDF for 40 years, and the guy who hit the Osirak reactor first in 1981 as a young pilot. A guy by the name of Mike Herzog, who is the brother of Bougie Herzog, of the Labor Party, but has been the military advisor uh, to the last four Israeli defense ministers, to the extent there's a Kennedy family in Israel, I think the Herzogs are probably it. A guy by the name of Dan Meridor, who was the deputy prime minister, the prime minister Netanyahu, a guy named Yaakov Amidror, who was the national security advisor of uh, prime minister Netanyahu. Um, a guy named Eli Levita, one of the most creative minds I ever met, PhD from Stanford, deputy head of the Israeli Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, formerly, and so for me to convene these people, it was like being, a, you know, it was, it was it was an honor. And the goal was to try to see could we distill ideas that no matter how bad the Obama and Netanyahu relationship was, that we could bring ideas to the negotiating team. And we did that for nine rounds, and then kind of like out of one of these Hollywood movies, 
where they, the justice of the peace is about to marry the couple and then says, if anyone has any objections, please rise now or forever hold your peace. We didn't do it as an objection, but basically we morphed that. I mean, I felt it was not proper to have the Israelis in the group um, when this was an American political football. So just the Americans. But the good idea at the point was that we had Democrats and Republicans sitting together over three years that came to trust each other. And so people were amazed when we came out with a bipartisan public statement, which you can find online at the Washington Institute.org uh, or other places, and took off in the New York Times and in, in, in all the editorial pages, that, that how do we work on the most sensitive national security issue uh, cross lines? Because there was trust that developed. And we tried to set certain thresholds of defining issues in the middle of the field. We didn't take any of what I call the end zone issues at the edges of the debate. And so it's, it's been a real honor to do that and, and to organize that. So it's, it's, it's been a very rough time. Uh, almost makes me say, my wife says, that wasn't the Israeli-Palestinian any easier than this? <laughs> um, anyway, so that's been my personal the last three years of dealing on that element of it. Uh, when I wasn't in government. The other, so let me just say a few points that I don't want to get jargony here, uh, but you need to know a few basic terms to have this discussion. Um, and that is, what does it take to build a bomb? And again, I'm not a nuclear physicist, but you need, right, you need a missile, right, to get from A to B. You need a detonator to go off, and that's considered like finding a needle in a haystack. And you need nuclear fuel. There's lower grade fuel, what we call LEU, low enriched uranium. That is reactor grade fuel. Then there is high enriched uranium, HEU, and that is weapons grade fuel. So the question is, how long does it take them to make a dash from reactor grade to weapons grade? And that's the long pole in the tent. And the debate, when you hear the debate, it's often about this issue about nuclear fuel, is because that's the one thing we, the world can measure. So that's where we're focused. Um, so that cushion from, is called, from the low enriched to the high enriched, is called breakout. Some of it called breakout, I think it's about a fast break in basketball or your skin breaks out. No. This is what happens if Iran throws out the inspectors for whatever reason and decides it's making a dash for it. For the high enriched uranium, which it needs as weapons grade fuel. And if it has that, and we assume that there's a detonator program to weaponize this, um, they have what they need. So the focus has been on the fuel. That issue of breakout has been at the center of the controversy in many ways. So the president will say, Look, I, we were two to three months today. Oh, that was, used to be classified, he declassified it. And said, you could say that, that if Iran today wanted to make the dash for, for a bomb, it would take them two to three months, two and a half, somewhere along that. The, the objective of the administration was to say, I want to get you a year, cushion. So if they cheat, you'll know, and you'll, you'll have a year to decide what to do. Of course, if there's a covert facility, you know, who says you'll get a year? Because you don't know what you don't know. And um, so therefore, that, that has been the big question. Um, has been one of the big questions, is how big is the cushion? And that's how big is the breakout time? Now, what gets the, the fuel going is something called centrifuges. That's what spins it and enables it to, to, to get you to where you want to go, or LEU to HEU. All the focus has been on uranium, but the truth is there's a second pathway to a bomb called plutonium. The plutonium route, I did a piece, an essay that came out of like retirement as a journalist several years ago to write an essay for the New Yorker magazine on Israel's secret strike, it was called the secret strike, and uh, the silent strike, and about Israel bombing uh, 
a plutonium reactor in Syria. But so Iran has also developed a plutonium trap. That is not breakout, but the, the core of the reactor is key, and there was a, feel, a fear that Iran was on its way for it to going hot. And that was, once it goes hot, you don't want to bomb a hot reactor, of course, because that is going to lead to radioactivity in, in the atmosphere. So two ways to bomb, uranium, plutonium. And the question is, what's the cushion that you have on the uranium side um, to, you know, to make sure that if they cheat, you've got wiggle room to make a decision. Okay, so I'm, I'm just saying that for the people who don't know, because I think that's, if you don't get that part, then you're going to miss a lot of those. So that's, class lesson is over on that. So let's now say there's this imaginary conversation, and uh, Netanyahu is invited back to the Oval Office. There's no cameras, there's no press. It's a very frank conversation. And uh, the President said, Bibi, welcome back. It's been many months, haven't seen you. I know you've been busy, I've been busy, but for all our differences, you know, I made sure you had a proper escort from Andrews Air Force Base, and they received as any other high um, head of government. Of course, we'll give you the same escort on the way back and no side trips to Capitol Hill. Uh, anyway, we're delighted that you're here. Um, I probably won't convince you, you probably won't convince me, but I am here to, to give you my case, and I want to hear your case, and I want you to answer some questions. Um, I'm not expecting a breakthrough, but I feel that this is too important. Um, so anyway, welcome back to the Oval Office. Barack, thank you very much. It's been several months. The last time I was here in March, I think you were a little busy. Um, and I had an election, I couldn't stick around. So I'm glad, I'm glad you're back, and don't worry, I'm not going to Capitol Hill. I already did a webcast from Jerusalem last week. So with modern technology, I don't need the escort. Um, anyway, it's a delight to be here. And you're probably right, we're not going to convince each other, but U.S. Israel relations are crucial for, for us, and I'm, I'm just honored to be here. I want to say that whatever our difference is, whenever reporters ask me, I say that you're a friend of Israel, and um, I say that there are policy differences between us, but that's what happens between friends. Okay, well, thank you, Bibi. I haven't always felt that way, but um, that you believe that. But anyway, it's good to hear it, and it's great to be here with you. So I'm glad you're here. So let me start it off. Look, Bibi, there's no journalists in the room. There's no advisors. It's just two of us. So we are speak very bluntly between us. And I'm a little upset that you don't acknowledge the good in this agreement. I'm buying you 15 years. The Middle East, I know, you'll tell me before I can tell you, so I'll tell you first, is a volcano. The Arab Spring, some people call it the Islamic winter, but the point is, it is a volcano. And in this volcano, I'm getting you 15 years, and we're kicking this can down the road. Maybe I tell the people, the American people, that we blocked all the pathways. We haven't really blocked all the pathways, but we have delayed it. And 15 years is a lot in that region. Some people think you've got to bomb them, but I even hear your own people saying that if you bomb them, maybe you'll get four years. I'll get you 15. That's almost four bombings. Sequentially, of that they bomb, you, they build, you bomb, they build. That's not, that's not chicken change. So that's, that, that's real stuff. Second, BB, I got to tell you, I got a year breakout. I, again, you may hold your applause, but you know, we just declassified for the American people. That's only two and a half to three months. We didn't want to scare the American people. So I'm getting you a year. That's not small stuff. To get that, what did I have to do? I got them to agree to take 10,000 kilograms of stockpile of uranium, low enriched, LEU and to drop that down to 300. You and I know that 10,000 kilograms is about eight pounds. If we say that to the American people, they get all nervous. 
but I'm going to take that, and they're not even close to one bomb, and they can only spin that one bomb, that, that 300 kilo, at only very low, low levels. And you admit that. Yes, I do. Okay, good. So we're getting somewhere. So this is something, you know, to get that stockpile. Are they going to ship it out to Russia? Is it under the IAEA lock and key? Doesn't matter. They don't get a penny, these people, until they come into compliance on the stockpile. You know that. Next, they have to take those center futures. They have 19,000. You're going to tell me they haven't even used 10,000, so the really operative figure is 9,000. Okay, I'll grant you nine. But I'm getting them down to 5,100. And these that they can spread, spin, are the most primitive versions. The IR1s. And you know they break down. You and I did some great work together, I did with your predecessor. Uh, because it started even before us, maybe, but the stuck's net. And so they had some problems, technical problems. Okay, they're going to have to mothball that, too. So this all together is not bad. And that plutonium track that you were worried about, you were sending me advisors, national security advisors here every few months, saying they're about to go hot in this place of Iraq, not to be confused with the country of Iraq. But uh, they have to rip out the core of that reactor. They don't get a penny before they rip it out. And they have to have that for 15 years. And if they rebuild, I think your experts, my experts, it'll take them another 10 on that one. So that's really like 25 years on the plutonium track. You add that together, BB, this is, is a great deal. Now, I know you don't think it's enough. And in any negotiations, people don't think it's enough. But I'm telling you that these guys are not easy customers, of course. And I've got a hope. I've got a hope. I look at the polling data. That's a, it's published. It's not classified. That says the young Iranian people, they're pro-Western. So what do I want to do? I want to hook them on the world economy. And I hope by hooking them on the world economy in 15 years, I'm going to transition them. What's the alternative? Remember the hostages 40 years ago? I mean, we just keep fighting and fighting. Rouhani, I know, he's not running the country. It's the Ayatollah one, I know, every day. But it's an opening. The people want change. This is the way to give them change, is to give them a window to the world. So uh, I'm not basing the whole farm. I'm not betting the farm on, on tra transformational change in Iran. But I know what the young people there want. We've got to get them integrated in the world economy. We've got to give these people something to lose economically. But let's hear your thoughts. Barack, thank you very much again. I, like, I, like you and I both said at the outset, we probably are not going to convince each other. But, um, you know, I, I want to tell you, in, in Jewish history, where you, when your enemies say they want to kill you, you got to believe them. A lot of people said about Hitler, domestic consumption, he's got his own politics over there in the 30s. Guess what? They went through with it. I'm not saying the Iranians or Hitler in the same way, but the Ayatollah puts out tweets, nine ways to annihilate Israel. And I'm supposed to ignore that? No, I've always said they're anti-Semitic, anti-American, insular, you know, uh, you know, they're no ally of the United States. I keep saying that. He goes, no, I know, but this is big for us. You think 15 years is a long time, but you've kicked the can. But I ask you, at what price have you kicked the can? What was the quid pro quo to get that 15 years? And for you, 15 years is long, but in the eyes of history, it's a blink of an eye. You yourself said that the hostages was 40 years ago. That means that's a lot of cans, you know, that we, we've gone through. So 15 years, you know, I don't know if that's going to be transformative. Uh, look, we all hope that you're right, that they somehow become part of the globalized world. But come on, you know, remember 2009? That was under your watch. Two million people in the streets of Tehran saying the election was a sham. I think the majority then was pro-American. I'll grant you what you say, and I'll even sharpen your point. But guess what? It didn't matter. Because in that country, the people who called the shots fired the shots. And that's the Ayatollah and his IRGC, the Revolutionary Guard. And they are in charge. So it doesn't matter what the majority wants in such a dictatorship. The people want change. I agree with you. But 
but they're not what counts. What counts is the people at the top. So I disagree with you, and I think you've got more of it. It's more of a hope than a strategy. But let me tell you where I also disagree with you. Again, I, I salute you on the 15 years, and I will even grant you 15 years. There are people in my security system that think they're going to cheat immediately. And I said at the cabinet meeting, I don't think they're going to cheat so fast. There's so much in it for them to go through with this deal. You have that, that sport in America called hockey, guys in the penalty box, and then after 15 years, he's back on the ice. They become legitimate. They're no longer a pariah. Why would they cheat? Maybe they'll cheat at the margins just to probe how you're going to react. That's fine. That's okay. But that's not transformational. What's transformational is 15 years. Then they're scot free. They get out of jail free card in Monopoly. They're back on the ice and they can have as much centrifuges as they want, as much uranium as they want. And tell me, Barack Obama, who's going to stop them once these people are legitimate in 15 years? That's my biggest concern. I can't sleep at night over that question. Tell me who is going to deter Iran in 15 years. If I grant you your point, then 15 years it'll be okay. Now you can bought us time, it's great, but it's insufficient. It's necessary, but insufficient. And the other price is what you did in negotiations, and I get it, because you weren't willing to bomb them, and so that kind of levels the playing field, as one of your pundits say, the world is flat in that regard. Once every, there's no leverage, then all the mutuality is, is the coin of the realm. So you want them to comply as, as the precondition of opening up their frozen accounts. Okay? Great. And they've got to do a bunch of things. But they could get the money in June of 2016. Now, I've heard different things. I've heard your Secretary of the Treasury, you know, there's been saying, some say 100 billion, you said 150. Then your treasury says, no, it's only 50, 56, because they owe money to the Chinese, and that's going to get deducted. Let's assume the lowest number, $56 billion. These are their, it's their money, people say. It's oil revenue in frozen bank accounts. And so what happened was, they told you, I'll front load compliance. I'll, I'll, I'll mothball the center futures. I'll deplete the stockpile of uranium. Um, and I will gut the core of the plutonium reactor in Iran. I'm going to do all those things. I'm going to have my year break out. And you got your cushion, but what's the trade-off? The trade-off is, A, 15 years, they're treated like a normal country, and we don't know who's going to deter these people. And second, the cash infusion these guys are going to get is massive. Let's assume it's only $56 billion. But it's not just that. They're going to get oil revenue, too. It's not just about block uh, revenue income. It's about new oil revenue and business opportunities with Europe and China and Russia. They're a pariah. This is a colossus. Their whole economy is like $400 billion. I think my people have said in American terms, the cash infusion they're getting alone is like an $8 trillion injection into their economy. Let's remember, I think you said on one of your television interviews that their whole defense budget is $30 billion. Uh, your Treasury Secretary went public and said that they have an unmet civilian infrastructure needs. So they expected that's a half a trillion. That works if Iran is Japan. But I guess what? They're not Japan. The Ayatollah has got to keep his coalition together. So if Rouhani gets a big win, the deep state has to get a big win. The deep state is the IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, led by uh, the head of the Al Quds Brigade named Qasem Soleimani, the Ayatollah, even if he was a moderate, which he isn't. We know he's so deeply ideological, and we know he's told people his fondest wishes to see Israel burn, that um, he's got to pay this guy big. Does he get 15 billion, 20 billion? We don't know. You don't know. None of us knows. But let's just have a sense of proportionality. Before the war in Syria, they were only giving Hezbollah $200 million. So if, if, if the IRGC gets a bigger cut, 
that money is going to Hezbollah. It's going to help Bashar al-Assad in Syria. It's going to Iraq, to the Shia there. Do you really want to help these people? You know, Hezbollah's having problems. By the way, Hamas might not take the money because the Saudis, to keep them in the Sunni fold, might get engaged in a bidding war with them and say, don't take their Iranian money, they're the devil. So we'll give you the saintly Sunni money. So whoever it is, Sunni money, Shia money, we lose, because we're there. And our public is against this. You know, most of the votes are 50-50. And I know in some of your press, I'm demonized like Richard Nixon was in the eyes of liberals. But let me tell you, on this issue, I got the Israeli people on my side. About 80, 80 10, 10, 10 million never made up their minds. But how can that be? Because they have suffered under the brunt of the rockets and the Hezbollah war and the Hamas war. Um, and even though the last war, maybe they didn't get as much funding from Iran because the Iranians are angry at them for different reasons that they don't support Assad enough. But still, Israel has been hit by all these rockets thanks to Iranian support. And my people know it. So this isn't one of your 50-50 splits where you can play off the Labor Party against Likud. No, no, no. The people are with me on this one. And, um, you know, this is not a, not a good situation here. You know, so who's going to stop the cash infusion? I want to know. This, these, are, these are two of my big issues. What happens in 15 years when they're legitimate people and they can have an arsenal? Yeah, they're not supposed to have a weapon under the, the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, but no one ever enforces that. I see there's foreign reports that Israel has 200 bombs. But the point is, we have never declared genocide on any people like the Iranians have. That's the difference. And we don't see who's going to deter them after 15 years. And B, what are you going to do now with the cash infusion to the Iranian proxies to embolden them um, to enhance Iran's uh, regional uh, influence in the Middle East? If you can answer those two questions, I might be with you. But I don't think you can. And therefore, I'm, I've got real problems with this. Then Obama comes back to me and says, "BB, very, very, you know, you make good points, and I'm not sure I've got all the answers you want, but I got some questions for you. Tell me what your alternative is. Don't you realize I'm trying to make lemon out of lemonade here? That I know the Chinese, the Russians, they're sick of sanctions, and if we leave this now, um, the sanctions are gone." So whatever whip we have, we lose. And also, you think the sanctions are huge in BB interjects. Yes, that's what brought Rouhani, got Rouhani elected as a moderate. The people wanted relief, and that's what brought him to the table, and that will get us a better deal. He goes, they brought him to the table because the public wants a saner policy. But if your enemy wanted you to eat dirt, would you eat dirt? No, they won't capitulate, and I'm telling you, I had to find that line between what I think would be an Iranian capitulation, which wouldn't have mattered because the sanctions started when George Bush, there were a couple hundred centrifuges. Now, as you and I agree, there's 19,000. So tell me how sanctions work exactly. I don't see the great, uh, yeah, I mean, I tell my people that they work, that's good. We call it a dual, a dual approach, which is negotiate and pressure. That's fine. But between you and me, no one else is in the room. Were they decisive? No, they got them to the table. But I don't think they'll do more. And uh, I got another question for you, BB. You know, I want to know this. Um, why are you interfering? This is an American congressional uh, decision. And my people are very hot under the collar about this. And um, he said, well, first of all, Mr. President, you guys with the loan guarantees in 1991, 92, without American pressure, we're being one to one. And second, let's be clear, you're at the table, we're not at the table, yet we're the one being threatened with annihilation. Not you, you live in the Northeast with the Cherry Blossom Festival. We live in the Mideast, and we'll be the biggest targets of this deal, and uh, the biggest losers of it. And he goes, yeah, you think you'll be the biggest losers? Tell me what happens if the deal unravels and uh, these guys go more nuclear. Uh, what's gonna happen then? And uh, he said, well, I think we put more sanctions on them, and the more enrichment they do, the 
the world will realize you can have both sanctions relief and more enrichment. So if they try to enrich, it facilitates more sanctions. Um, they won't be able to have both if they have if they go for, if they go for more. But it's unclear if they will. And your people, by the way, Mr. President, they're putting stuff out there that uh, even if Congress says no, they're gonna you know that it'll go ahead without us. And so. Uh, yeah, maybe that's, that's a legitimate possibility. What's your answer to that? Well, look, I feel this way. Look, you, usually for a treaty in America, my understanding is you need 67. You have kind of finagled the rules on the United States, so you only need 34. It's not a treaty, maybe. It's a political agreement. I don't know what the distinction is, but this is the biggest arms control deal in 30 years for America. Tell me the distinction. How did you, instead of having a bar of 67 senators, you need a bar of 34. That's a low bar, and it's got to be in both houses. Well, first of all, B.B., I want to thank you because you actually made my life easier. Oh, I did. How's that? Well, this is the way you did it because your speech in March helped me consolidate the Democrats. So I really should write you a thank you note. And, uh, you know, 13 Democrats, it's not going to be easy. Chuck Schumer, it's yours. You got it. But there's not 13 Chuck Schumers out there. So you might be wasting your time. Yeah, and, and, and the House would like to be there. 45 is the bar in terms of all the Republicans. Let's assume they all vote against me because they hate me, because I did the deal. And uh, but then they got 45 other Democrats. My, my head counters say, you don't come even close. So tell me how this is all going to come out. Well, I, I don't want to embarrass your feelings a lot. This is going to implicate the next administration. No, 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 tell me really what you think. Well, OK, you want me to tell you. And that is, you'll win this round, probably, unless something happens. The Ayatollah says something stupid. Some other evidence comes out. But let's say you win. But the next administration, it'll be clear the American people aren't with this policy. And uh, if you got 60 against you, not 67, 60, that will be a message to the next administration. The American people are not with their president. And it will be easier to unravel. Oh, I heard that from the Republicans on health care. How did that turn out exactly? It <laughs> uh, didn't turn out too well. Um, so anyway, it goes on and on back and forth and back and forth. So that's a little bit of these arguments. These are not uh, fake arguments. You know, someone who's in Washington and, and, and deals with the administration. This is stuff I hear all the time. Some of you might have seen a quote I, I had in the New York Times. I had two of them. One was in the lead story a week ago uh, today, and one was another front page piece two weeks, two days later. The reporter kind of sliced and diced what I said. But um, my point there uh, was whatever the debate, it shouldn't fly off a cliff. And I am concerned uh, when it gets out of bounds. Uh, and that means you don't say that, you know, there's certain people banging the drums for war. Uh, you could criticize this president and, and not be accused of being a warmonger. Uh, as a think tank guy, this is what we do. We try to get the best, the best arguments on both sides. Um, and so this, this very greatly disturbed me that the debate is heading towards the gutter. And I'm nervous about that. I'll be very blunt about it. I just want to say what we're down to, and then I'll open it up. Um, but there's really two schools of thought. And I'd love to say it's Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai, but I don't think that would be a fair way to look at it. But there's two schools. There's one school that says you got to block for the reasons that the prime minister said in, in the imaginary dialogue because this is not redeemable, that because you could get around, squeeze them more, get them back to the table. And for them, it's, it's about making a point because making a point now can make a difference later. Then there's the other school that says, it's not about blocking it, it's about fixing it. In other words, the commonality between the two schools is that they don't take this agreement at its face value. But the fix-it school would say, you know, this, there's some real achievements here for all the reasons that Obama listed. But there's some real risks here and vulnerabilities too. 
And how do you optimize the advantages and minimize the risks? That is always the, the golden goal in all these negotiations. And like I said, no one's ever happy with any compromise. The fix-it school would say, look, there's some things that Netanyahu raised that are right. 15 years, you know, it's a blink of an eye, maybe. And maybe they don't globalize and they all like start waving American flags. Then what? Some people in Israel see the volcano and they'll say, give me 15 years, I'll take that anyway. I mean, that's, I don't even know what's gonna happen next week. You give me 15 years, I'll sign. But that school would say, you're not gonna get to renegotiate the four corners of the agreement. Um, you're going to be able to have in parallel to the agreement some American policies that would run alongside it. And they would say the following. It's about, and the, the fix it school would say, it's not about making a point, it's about making a difference now. The fix it school doesn't believe you can make a difference because they don't, they question the president's sincerity as well. Um, the fix it school would say, look, let's put down now, American policy is that our interpretation of the agreement is that in 15 years, Iran cannot get HEU. They cannot have high enriched uranium. And we want the Congress to endorse that. You could say, does it matter what Barack Obama says? He's not gonna be president in 15 years. But there's a certain moral authority of the guy who negotiated the deal, who's considered one of America's leading doves, who would say there's a certain line we're not gonna cross. We're not going to let these guys get high enriched uranium in 15 years. This regime. So I think the fix it school, um, there's four points and then I'll stop. Point one is deterrence when it comes to Iran in the longer term, is you have to put down some red lines now. You might not call them red lines because the red lines get associated with the Syria issue. Second thing for long term deterrence is. If you don't believe America, you don't believe the president, you don't believe the Congress, maybe you'll believe Israel. So we're gonna give Israel something called the MOP. The MOP is Massive Ordnance Penetrator. You've heard of a bunker buster? This is a mountain buster. This goes through the Fordell Mountain where they have one of their main programs. And I should say that both Fordell and Natanz, the two workhorse programs, will be under 24 seven surveillance in a way they have not been before. And that's a good thing. So point two is to say in the next 15 years, give Israel the means to defend itself. If Iran doesn't believe America, maybe they'll believe Israel. Israel doesn't have the planes, the B-2, the B-52, to carry them on. But this should be an American commitment, point two, point three. When it comes to cash infusion, you've gotta be more activist. Uh, they're going to say it's their money that they are unblocking, unfreezing, but a lot of the stuff is going to be, um, you know, frankly, uh, does it, you know, the Treasury has executive orders that designates banks, entities, uh, individuals. Uh, right now, 22 of the 25 banks are boycotted from dealing with Israel because of the nuclear issue. Only three are because of terrorism. But maybe they're more involved in terrorism and we haven't looked at it closely enough. Can we designate more to sap some of the money? Can we engage in contingency planning to help Israel, the Gulf states, interdict Iranian ships headed for Hezbollah? You know, that would all be under how to block them regionally. Uh, and the final point I would make is the issue of, of infractions. Right now, if the only penalty is a death penalty, it's not credible. You can say, well, if they don't, if they violate, we'll snap back the sanctions and we'll bring down the whole house. But in most agreements, the reason why people like the agreements is because they think there's something in it for them. So how, how likely is the Europeans and the Russians and the Chinese going to snap back sanctions in, in the wake of violations? If, but there's got to be gradations under the ultimate penalty, medium-sized penalties, uh, medium-sized violations. Uh, do we have a common Rashi, a common interpretation with the European allies? Forget the Russians and Chinese, but with us in Europe, we're a majority. And by the way, they said it was a deal breaker that the U.S. could unilaterally snap back sanctions. But those are our sanctions. What about their sanctions? So it seemed to me as a final point, the fix-it school would say, 